to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the greatest question ever asked is found in Acts 16, verse 30 and 31. The Philippian jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? No greater question in all the world can be asked and answered by the Bible and by every individual. But today, as we think about the subject of salvation, we want to ask the question, saved from what? If the Philippian jailer realized he needed to be saved, what did he need to be saved from? Did he need to be saved from society? Did he need to be saved from modern thinking of that day? Did he need to be saved from the threat on his life that might be made by being, being a part of the Roman government and these men getting out? What exactly did he need to be saved from? Those are the things that we're going to be thinking about today in our study of salvation. As always, we want to take this opportunity to welcome you to our program today. We're so glad that you've joined us. If you don't have it handy already, we want to ask you to get your Bible and be following along with us today. As always, please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a, a variety of Bible study things that you can get there, uh, questions and answers. We have uh, tracks. We have uh, articles and things of that nature that you can study from, as well as all our DVDs and CDs are available free upon request from our media request section of our website. And today's lesson, of course, are being brought to you is being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ, and we encourage you to stop by and visit their assemblies. Let's now direct our attention to the question, saved from what? What did the Philippian jailer need to be saved from? Friend, this is such an important question that is really worthy of every person's serious consideration. And to answer this question properly, we don't want to give human opinion. We don't want to go to some poll or, or look at what might be popular today. The only way to answer this question is to go directly to the source, the Bible. Romans 4 verse 3, we want to let God's Word answer it. For Paul asked the question in Romans 4 verse 3, what does the Scripture say? That's all that matters. And really, that's all that we're concerned about today. What does the Scripture say that man is being saved from? Let's also realize that once we go to the right source, we've got to also realize human wisdom. My thinking, your thinking, society's thinking, it can't adequately, adequately answer uh, the question. We're not here today to tell you what we think or to tell you what others think or, or, or what some theologian somewhere might think. They can't answer that question correctly. Only God can. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10 verse 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Man can't figure out his own path to salvation. He needs God's direction. And Proverbs 14 verse 12 and chapter 16 verse 25 says this, There's a way that seems right to a man. What about that way? The end thereof is the way of destruction. It's the way it seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death or destruction. Let's not put our trust in human thinking on this subject. Let's put our trust in God. Notice the words of Proverbs 28, verse number 26. The Bible says this, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. God and His wisdom and His teaching can deliver me from the problem that I need saved from. But only God can give me that advice. And so what is it man needs to be saved from? Let's realize that it's sin that we need to be saved from. Now friend, let's each be honest today. Sin is a reality that every person of an accountable age has to deal with. Like it or not, 
want to think about it or not, I've got to come to terms with the fact that if I'm of an accountable age and a right mind, then friend, I have sinned. You have sinned. And we need sal salvation from that sin. Uh, listen to Romans 3, verse 23. The Bible says all, how many? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If all have sinned, then I have sinned. Ecclesiastes 7, verse number 20, the Bible says there's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who uh, does good and does not sin. Every person, even the most righteous among us, has to deal with the sin problem. And friend, I need salvation from that sin because if I remain in it and if I die in it, I'll be lost. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, sin separates a man from God. Why? Habakkuk 1 verses 12 and 13 says, God is of pure eyes than to behold evil. He cannot look upon wickedness. And so it is our sin that every one of us at one point in time or another has committed that we need to be saved, saved from. And let's realize as we think about this idea, let's realize that God does have a lot to say on the subject of sin in His Word. You know, we live in a society today that we almost don't like to think about and talk about sin. People don't want to mention anything that might be sinful or wrong today. They don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. They don't want to make anybody feel bad. Let's realize we've got to say what God says on the subject of sin so that people can be saved. Our responsibility is to speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4 verse 11. And friend, really, why would we ever allow anyone else outside of Jesus and the words of the Bible to teach us on this subject? I love the words of Luke 11, verse number 1. The disciples said to Jesus, Lord, teach us. Teach us to pray was their request. But that's the thought of every person and how we ought to think today on the subject of sin. We want Jesus to teach us about sin. Now, friend, as you think about this subject and as we think about listening to the voice of God, letting God speak to us on this problem, let's also realize that sin is a reality that man has no cure for. No matter how hard he might try, no matter how long he might look, man can't solve the sin problem. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 22, here's what God said to Israel about their sin problem. God said, Though you wash with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is ever before me. You know, if you get something on your hand, or if you get something on your clothes, you can go to the sink, you can get a bar of soap or a, a bottle of soap, you can put that on your hands and you can wash it and most of the time you can get it off. You get something on your clothes, you can put a little detergent in the wash machine and, and run that through a cycle and you can get rid of it. God said that's not how it works with sin. Though you wash with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is ever before me. What's God saying? You're not going to take care of the sin problem with soap and water. You're not gonna, you can't get enough lye and enough soap to deal with the sin problem. And so man needs God's help and man needs God's direction to deal with it. Listen to Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 12. God said, There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet it is not washed from its filthiness. Man can't deal with it in and of himself. He needs God's help to be right with Him. But let's also realize this. As we think about sin and what man can do to be saved from it, let's realize God does have the cure. Thank God that He has the cure and the remedy for the sin problem. What is that cure? Jesus is the answer. Matthew 1 verse 21, You shall call His name Jesus. Why? He'll save His people from their sins. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 1 Peter 2, 24, He bore our sins in His own body upon the tree that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. God so loved the world He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish 
but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Those verses clearly and beautifully illustrate that the remedy for sin is found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, God wants to forgive. Micah 7, verse 18. God wants to pardon man from sin. Nehemiah 9, verse 17. And God is willing to abundantly pardon or forgive us of our sins. Isaiah 55, verse number 7. But He can only do that through the plan and the person of Jesus Christ. And so let's think today about the subject of sin and how one can overcome this problem. We ask first and foremost, what is sin? You know, when you think about sin, there's a, a very de descriptive, there's a very clear way of describing and defining that from the Scripture. And we mention three passages that help us with that. What is sin? 1 John chapter 3, verse number 14, sin is a transgression of God's law. When we think about sin, we think about breaking God's law. You know, if you're driving in a car and you go over the speed limit, you break the laws of that land and the police or the Department of Safety individual may be able or will give you a ticket if he catches you doing that. Why? You've transgressed the law. Well, friend, this is God's perfect law of liberty. James chapter 1, verse 25. This is the law that I'm going to be judged by on the day of judgment. John 12, verse number 48. And if I break this law, if I transgress this law, if I know what the Bible tells me to do, or if I do something that I'm not supposed to in the Word of God, then friend, I have broken or transgressed God's law, and that is a sin. 1 John 5, verse 17 would be the second verse. All unrighteousness is defined as sin. Not only transgressing, but when I know it's right that I do this, and I know it's right that I have this type of character or this type of action in my life, and I do the opposite. I have done that which is unright or unrighteous, and I have fallen into sin. And so breaking the law of God, doing what is wrong in the sight of God, and then a third passage helps us to understand what sin is so we can avoid it and be saved from it. James 4, 17 says this, For him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Now, this is more of not doing anything that may be right. We haven't really gone out and broken any law, maybe. We haven't really gone out and done anything that's wicked. But if I know that it's good to help the poor, if I know that it's good to spread the gospel, if I know it's good to try to encourage others or whatever it may be, and I just don't do anything, that inaction, knowing when I ought to act, knowing that I should have acted, knowing that I should have done right, that inaction and doing nothing on my part. Friend, the Bible says that's also contrary to the will of God and is a sin. And so let's think a little bit about how the Bible describes sin so that we can better understand the heart of God on sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 1, the Apostle Paul describes sin in the terms of a defilement, something that makes man defiled or dirty, unclean in the sight of God. Listen to these words. Paul said, Therefore having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What is sin? It's a defilement or it's filthy. Think about the last time you got, you got mud or you got oil or you got just something filthy on your hands. How did that make you feel? How, how, how bad did you want to get to the sink and get some soap and wash that off? Well, pretty quickly, right? It made you feel pretty nasty. Well, sin, in God's way of thinking, is a defilement of His creation. God also describes sin in the sense of a, a stain or a spot on that which ought to be pure and holy. James 1.27, James says, Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained or unspotted from the world. You know, if you've got a white shirt, 
let's say you've got a, a white shirt on and you've got an ink pen in the pocket and that you probably may have had this happen. That black ink pen eventually leaks. And now you've got a big black spot right here on this white shirt. How bad does that look? How, how much did it mess up that white garment? Can you use that? Probably not. You probably have to throw the thing away. Why? Because now it's spotted or it's stained. God wants us to be pure and holy. Be holy as He who called you is holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 15. And when we have sin in our life, God describes that as a, a sin or a stain on that which ought to be holy and right in His sight. But then there's a third description that I want you to uh, think about with me today. Psalm 38 verse 4. David said this, My sins have gone over my head like a heavy burden, they're too heavy for me to bear. How does the Scripture describe sin? It's a heavy burden that you just can't bear on your own. You ever tried to lift something that you just knew was too heavy for you? Maybe you've tried to lift some big heavy load and you hurt your back. Or maybe you've tried to lift something and, and you kind of got under that weight and you almost couldn't get out from under it. Friend, sin is a burden around your neck. It's a burden on your back. It's something that you cannot bear. You know, if you've been in sin, you know what I'm talking about. You know what the Scripture is talking about. Carrying that weight around, knowing that you've done something wrong, knowing that you're not right with God, knowing that that burden is on your heart and mind and, and you need to have it dealt with. And until you do, you'll never release that weight that's bearing you down. And so sin is a filthiness or defilement. It's a stain or a spot. And it is a burden that will bear you down until you let God and Christ help you with that. This is why Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus is able to help us with the weight and the burden of our sin. Now, as you think about sin and that which we need to be saved from, let's also think about God's thinking about this subject of sin. You know, the Bible says God has no pleasure in sin. Psalm 5 verse 4. I think, I think sometimes men kind of take pleasure in. We talk about it in words that describe it as very pleasurable, and yet Psalm 5 4 says God has no pleasure in sin. Hebrews 1 verse 9, Jesus hates lawlessness or wickedness. God doesn't delight in it. Christ hates it. And Nahum 1 verse 3 says this, There is no acquittal for the wicked. You know, governments, presidents, pardon boards, uh, and parole boards, they may acquit or they may pardon somebody. They may have committed a crime and they may eventually be free from that. There's not going to be any acquittal for sin unless we obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the problem again is that all have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. The problem is that sin is of my own doing. Uh, because sin has entered my life, I have the effects of that in my heart and mind. And friend, let's realize the penalty of sin, if it's not dealt with, is going to be devastating to one's life. Realize these things with me today. The Bible teaches that sin ultimately is going to bring spiritual death. Ephesians 2 verse 1, Paul said to those who have obeyed the gospel that although they once were dead in their trespasses and sins, they'd been set free. But listen to those words again. You He made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. When we think about sin and why a person needs to be saved from that, friends, sin is going to lead to it. If a person's in sin, if you're in sin, if I'm in sin, I live in that sin and I die in that sin, I will suffer spiritual death. Matthew 25, 46, the righteous will go away into eternal life, the unrighteous into eternal death. What else does sin do? Sin separates me from that which I need the most, God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. The Lord's ear is not heavy, that He cannot hear. God doesn't need a hearing aid. God doesn't have a hearing problem. The Lord's arm's not shortened. God doesn't have a defective arm that He can't reach out and save me. What's the problem then? Your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. What makes sin so devastating? 
Sin separates me from the source of all light. God is light, John 8, 12. The source of all love, 1 John 4, verse 8. And that which is good and holy and right, God Himself. And friend, you do not want to be separated from God for all eternity. Thirdly, we mentioned this. Sin is so devastating because it is sin that sent Jesus to the cross. When you think about the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the, the shame, the horror, uh, the tragedy, the, the pain that was involved in that, where Jesus actually had nails mailed, nailed into His hands and feet, where, where He hung uh, suspended between heaven and earth and struggled for every breath and, until He died. Why did He do that? For sin. He bore our sins in His own body. 1 Peter 2, 24. He was chastised for our sin, bruised for our iniquity. By His stripes, we've been healed. When you think about the devastating effects of sin and the length, the, the depth that God went to to save man, look at what Jesus had to suffer. And friend, we want you to think real clearly about this with us today from the Scripture. When we talk about being saved from sin, that is the what that we're saved from, let's realize if a person remains in sin, the end result is that person will be lost in a devil's hell for eternity. Now I know nobody likes to think about hell. Hell's a bad place and you're right it is. But to really understand the necessity of salvation, let's realize there is a place called hell. Mark chapter 9, verse 44, Jesus said, Hell is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That word for worm would be akin to our word for maggot. What, what's hell like? It's a place where the maggot never dies and the fire is never, nobody ever puts out the fire. Uh, think about the words of Luke 16, 19 through 31. You've got the illustration of the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man awoke in torments. Uh, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. I'm tormented in this flame. Send Lazarus to get just one drop of water that I can be comforted. No, there's no getting out. Uh, send word back to my brothers. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Can't you hear the, the echo for all eternity of the rich man? I'm tormented in these flames. Friend, do you want to spend eternity in hell and torment and fire and anguish forever? Then realize... That's the penalty of living a life in sin and dying in that. Uh, Matthew 13, verses 40 through 42, it's going to be a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so, you know, when you think about what do I need to be saved from? Nobody in their right mind, honestly thinking about their soul, would consider sin and the fact that it's going to cause you to be lost in hell for eternity and not do anything about it. Now, let's shift gears though, and let's think about the positive. There is a cure, there is a remedy, and there is a sacrifice for sin, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you say to yourself today, you know what, I wanna be saved from sin. I don't wanna be lost, I don't wanna be separated from God. I don't wanna keep living with this burden around my neck for all eternity or all this life. What do I need to do to get rid of the sin problem? Friend, the good news is Jesus is the answer to that. Jesus is the cure to the sin problem. Hebrews 10 verse 12, this man, Jesus, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of the Father. Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant that is shed for many for the remission of sins. He tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2 verse 9, God sent His Son to die for sin and to die for us so that we don't have to be lost. And do you remember what Jesus said about being saved from sin? Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Friend, you cannot be saved from sin outside of Jesus Christ. You'll call His name Jesus. Why? He'll save His people from their sins. Matthew 1, verse number 21. And so we realize Jesus is the cure. We realize Jesus is the only way to be saved. And we need to realize 
there can be no salvation without obedience to the words of Jesus and recognizing and honoring Him as Lord. Do you remember again Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21? Jesus said to those of His day and age, some said, Lord, do we not prophesy in Your name? Do we not cast out many good uh, demons in Your name? Not do many good works in Your name? Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And then He would go on to say, it's not everybody that says, Lord, Lord. Not everybody that says, I believe in God. I believe in Christ. I'm a Christian that's going to be saved. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven. He who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so let's think about that for a moment. What does the Bible say you've got to do to be saved from sin? Friend, the Bible makes it abundantly clear. On the first day that the gospel was preached, on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and he proclaimed the message of salvation. They heard the Word of God. You've got to listen to and hear what God says before you can even begin to be saved. Romans 10, verse 17. They believed Jesus was the Son of God. They cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That implies when Peter said, Let all the house of Israel know, Surely God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They realized then and there, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Once you have heard the Word and believed in Jesus, you then must be willing to repent. Peter said in Acts 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins. Once you have repented, then friend, you've got to do what Peter said. You must be baptized to be saved. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, unless... A man is born of water and the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so, have you heard the message? Do you believe in Jesus? Are you willing to repent of sin? Would you acknowledge Him as Savior? And would you be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins? You know, that Philippian jailer knew it. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Do you realize that you've got to be saved from sin? And I hope and pray today that you realize that and that you'll get your life right with God before it's too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.